This is Angela Pizzola, manager of the Oral History Program with the Battleship New Jersey in Camden, New Jersey. Today is Saturday, May 19th, 2018. We are on board the Battleship New Jersey, and our interview guest is William Hines from Charlottesville, Virginia. Mr. Hines was an officer on board USS New Jersey during the latter part of the 1980s commission. Welcome home, Mr. Hines. Thank you so much. And uh, what is your current age? <laughs> 53. All right. And when did you first enlist? I joined the uh, ROTC program at the University of Virginia in 1982. Okay. I'm sorry, 1983. All right. And uh, how old were you when you joined the Navy? 18 years old. All right. And what was your inspiration for joining the Navy? Uh, my father uh, was career military, career Navy as well. And uh, I think unlike a lot of other veterans, his thing was, son, please don't join the Navy. <laughs> and he might as well have just signed the enlistment papers for me because I was, I was absolutely determined to join. Okay. And um, give us some background on your officer training. Uh, so I went through uh, the Reserve Officer Training uh, Candidate School at the University of Virginia. Uh, basically, you know, you can either think of it as a, you know, a, a lighter version of the Naval Academy or a drawn out version of Officer Candidate School. Uh, four years, uh, eight naval science classes encompassing weapons, engineering, navigation, leadership, and the like. Uh, plus uh, periodic uh, drills and leadership lessons. Um, at the time, uh, I just didn't get it. You know, we lined up in formations and we marched around, left flank, right flank, halt. And, and at 18 years old, I'm like, oh, this, is, this is absolutely ridiculous. But uh, as I got older, I realized that, uh, yeah, there actually is kind of a point to that in terms of learning how to actually issuing a command like you mean it and projecting your voice and body carriage and all that. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just one of the uh, things I learned along the way is, you know, there, there's actually a reason why we do a lot of this stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Any stories you'd like to share about uh, some of your time in those officer trainings? Any, uh, uh, any anecdotes? You know, I was in engineering school and between engineering school and ROTC, it, it, I, I just always felt very busy, put upon, harassed. And, uh, you know, so many other people are like, man, I'm having the time of my life. College is the best four years of my life. And all I could think was, please, someone commission me so I can get to the fleet and just be rid of this. So, uh, uh, but at the same time, you know, being an ROTC was, was very interesting when, when you wore your service dress whites and uh, the girls really loved that. And, uh, you know, and at that age, having the girls actually notice you and trying to angle for dates to the military ball because they wanted to go to a guy who was wearing the choker whites in the uh, the movie uh, An Officer and a Gentleman was popular at the time. And well, when you're 19, 20 years old, that's a nice perk. So uh, <laughs> so that, that's probably the main takeaway of, you know, that I had during the ROTC program. Mm -hmm. And when you first went into service, what was your first assignment? Um, <clears throat> so I was uh, given orders to the USS New Jersey and just due to a, a gap in the timing before I could go to surface warfare officer school, I actually got to report to the New Jersey before I, I went to school. And I was there for about two months, and this was from January 1987 to either the end of, Feb uh, end of February. So I actually got to qualify officer of the deck in port, um, got, got kind of got a head start on my qualifications. And uh, it was kind of good because I, I would go to surface warfare officer school and a lot of this stuff, you know, it's kind of like, I've, I've seen this, I'm, I'm already, I'm already well underway on that. Uh, but one of the things I do remember was uh, we had a midshipman gathering at the University of Virginia, and they read out the orders of those who, who were graduating. And this was a December graduation. Uh, a lot of engineers had to do an extra semester uh, because of the additional classes, and the naval science classes didn't count towards the degree. And I remember uh, one fellow was going to nuclear power school, and a couple of them were going to flight school. And then they said, and, Midshipman Hines has gotten orders to the USS New Jersey. And there was this buzz. The New Jersey. You get to go to a battleship. And, um, and I had requested it. And when I was a kid, my well, heck, I was a kid at that point. Who, who am I kidding? Um, I had built a model ship of the USS New Jersey and one of the Missouri and the Wisconsin. And, and it was kind of like, wow, you know, how often do you get to build the model ship and then go serve on the thing? I mean, it, really, it's like six, seven years later. It, uh, it, you know, when I stopped to think about this, like, wow, this is, this is kind of unreal. Now, when the first time you saw the New Jersey, as you were reporting, where did you report to the New Jersey, and what was your initial reaction by seeing it in person? 
So uh, two parts to that one. I had um, I'd spent a bit of leave at my parents' home in Florida before I was uh, to report to the ship. And on the route there, I actually stopped by the USS Alabama Museum in Mobile. And so I got to tour that. I'm like, wow, this is, this is a pretty neat ship. And, but I knew enough of the history to know that the South, Car uh, the South Dakota class was kind of on the smallish side. Although at the time, I'm like, well, that's a pretty darn big ship. Uh, my father had served on the Eisenhower, so I, I had seen a full-blown aircraft carrier, and I knew it that. But I got to Long Beach, ready to port on board, and it said, oh, well, New Jersey's not here. You need to drive down to San Diego. And I drove down to the base there, and I saw New Jersey for the first time, and I was thinking, my God, now that's a warship. Um, and I think that's kind of the reaction a lot of people have the first time they see the ship. Um, there's an aesthetic to it, and I don't know if the naval architects meant it to be that way, but it, it's a beautiful ship. Uh, it has beautiful lines, and it, it looks the part. Um, and I was telling my family, you know, about... Uh, you know, said, well, how often do you spend at sea? And I said, you know, we actually spent probably more time in port than we did at sea because that, that was part of it was, you know, showing people the flag. And there was not many more effective ways of showing the flag than having an Iowa-class battleship come into port uh, because just it, it was a sign of resolve just by itself. It's even when I think about it. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so we're going to talk about a little bit about everyday life on board. Uh, <laughs> So is there any uh, sh stories you'd like to share about you know, your time on board, just everyday life, boardroom, all of that? You know, uh, one of the things, it was always this kind of dichotomy because uh, on the one hand, I always felt very tired. And, uh, you know, the watch schedules kept you busy as a junior officer. You were trying to get your qualification for the surface warfare officer pin, uh, engineering officer of the watch. I mean, there was just like seemingly a jillion things that you had to qualify in. But the other thing I always remember was just this, the hijinks. And um, in the Halsey cabin, there was a, uh, there was a painting of Halsey, and I, I don't think it's there right now, and I don't know what became of it. But there was another junior officer who, for reasons that will not be stated, we, we like to pick on. Um, and it was, you know, in, in some respects, it was kind of a cruel humor. But we managed to get a photo of him, and we, uh, we, and we were in the Philippines, and we had this painting done of him off of the photo in velvet. And uh, it was kind of like an Elvis on velvet, only with this officer's name. And we had him decked out as kind of like this super fleet admiral with gold up the sleeves like you wouldn't believe. And we actually ended up kidnapping the Halsey painting and putting his painting uh, in its place. <laughs> and uh, Captain Tucker comes up to me later and he goes, Heinz, I know you did it. I'm like, what are you talking about, sir? Just stop it. Just put the Halsey painting back before anyone notices. And... Yeah, we had to put the Halsey painting back, but we ended up putting that other painting in the wardroom. And uh, it's just funny because, you know, you think of the military service and people watch movies and stuff and they, you know, they think of this very rigid, yes, sir, no, sir, and people walking in straight lines and, you know, very rigid limb movements and um, and just some of the fun that we had on stuff like that. Uh, the, you know, those will always be the two memories that I that I carry along with me is the aggravation, but the, the hilarity that went with it. Mm hmm uh, who were your executive officers when you were on board? Um, you know, I, I have to confess, the, the two months that I was on board, I had very little dealings with either the CO or the XO, and I mm -hmm. honestly don't even remember the XO's name, which is not a slight on the man. It was just, um, you know, a reflection on my time. But uh, I was, the, the two main portions that I was on board from uh, 87 through 90 was Dan Salinas and uh, Captain William Smith. Mm -hmm. Okay. And... Um, was the uh, wardroom etiquette uh, formal, informal? What was that like? Um, it, it was funny. My wife was listening to this, and she goes, oh, it says here that, uh, you know, you guys had formal dinners with china and silverware and, and linen and all this. And I'm like, well, that might be what the audio tour says, but that's not how it really was, and, <laughs> and it really couldn't be. Uh, there, and, and when I say, and I don't mean to suggest it's informal or crude, uh, there was a protocol. But, uh, you know, there was none of this white glove stuff or anything like that. The, the one thing I will say is that uh, there were three things that, you know, we were always admonished not to speak about, which was you don't talk about sex, religion, or politics. And I remember we had one uh, very junior officer come on board and, well, let's have me politic about this. Let's just say that he had gone out on Liberty Port the night before and had uh, enjoyed himself 
with some of the, the local ladies, and he proceeded to talk about it. And I remember one of the more senior officers actually wrapped the table and said, that'll be enough of that. So, you know, there's some crudeness to it, but at the same time, it's kind of like, but we will maintain a sense of decorum. And the other thing that I, I particularly liked and learned about was um, uh, right before dinner or lunch uh, was the phrase, knock off ship's work. And occasionally you'd have someone who would try to bring up ship's work and all the other officers would start, you know, and, and you know, it's like, knock off ship's work, knock off ship's work. <laughs> and I, I learned a real lesson from that later on in life, you know, whenever I'm eating a meal or something like that and someone tries to get into office talk or, or, or the like, I'd be like, you know, let us enjoy our meal. Let us, you know, take our minds off of the task at hand for a moment and, um, you know, recharge, uh, revitalize, however you wish to phrase it. So that was a, one of the takeaways I, I, I had from that moment. All right. Um, tell me about the bull ensign horns. Ah, uh, yes, the bull ensign horns. So the there were two ensigns, the, the most junior and the most senior. The, the most junior was the George ensign. The bull ensign, um, and I don't know where we got them, but it was this god-awful set of cattle horns that literally went out to here. And you also got two sets of very large ensign bars that you were to wear on your uniform and that, you know, basically said the bull. But when the senior most ensign got promoted to lieutenant junior grade, he turned over the horn, the set of horns and the bars to the next man in line. And, you know, it was a little ceremony and the, you stood there and someone held the horns over your head. And I believe there's actually a picture of me in the base newspaper with the horns sprouting from my head like that and uh it was uh, i wish i could find it because it was actually pretty funny uh as it turned out i was the bull ensign for such a short period of time that i really didn't get to to lord it over anyone like that uh and there wasn't much privilege to it which you really didn't want to be with the george ensign because you ended up getting tasked with all these menial uh details and the likes and unfortunately when i got on board i was just enough in the mix, and we had a whole slew of ensigns come on board at the time of, uh, this was after a yard period after the previous deployment. So I was just kind of in the mix there, neither junior nor senior, so. Uh, did you hide them? Uh, someone hit them, and it wasn't me, and uh, that was, and that was one of the things, if you lost your horns as the bull ensign, it was, it was somewhat of a state, uh, a state scandal, and uh, mine were lifted from my bunk room and I, I shared it with three other men and we usually didn't lock it and frankly we had no valuables worth purloining anyway and I came in one time and they're gone and I'm like oh no and I'm only the bull ensign for like another week or two and like for god's sakes and this was very typical of the sort of things that were done I mean my my, my very first day on ship I uh you know you'd leave your uniform set up and someone had come in and actually removed my insignia. And I walked into the, the wardroom for breakfast and the XO saw me and the XO clearly knew what was gonna happen. And said, Hines, are you a civilian? Well, I don't know what you mean, sir. Well, surely you must be a civilian because you're not wearing any military rank. <laughs> Run back to my stateroom, dig up a, another box of uh, ensign, uh, uh, paraphernalia and then come on board but those are the sort of little pranks that you were always playing on each other and I frankly don't even remember how the horns got recovered they were hiding in someone's stateroom or something like that but uh, it was it was always something like that and you uh, and I, I think some of it was partly you know people testing you what sort of sense of humor do you have um, and also in a way kind of developing a bit of resiliency because you got to get used to the especially in the military life you know not everything goes your way and it's you know, there's fatigue and there's separation and uh, the food is lousy at times and, and the like. And I think it was just one of those things where you you tested the metal of the guy around you. And, you know, and the one thing they always tell you is like, if it gets under your skin, don't let anyone know it gets under your skin because you're going to get a dose of that until you you, you learn to thicken up and, um, you know, and you're like, eh. So. All right, so let's talk about uh, more of your duty stations. Uh, first of all, uh, what was your general quarter station? For almost the, the entire time, I was always involved with the damage control aspect of it. I had an engineering degree, and uh, very early on, uh, they needed somebody to plot stability and buoyancy and damage control. And, I mean, a simple, you know, moment arms and stuff like that, and they sent me to school to do it. 
and I could pretty much do it in my head. And the damage control assistant said, oh, well, you're, you're hanging out with me in damage control central. Uh, so about the first year, that was my assignment, was actually sitting right at the elbow of the damage control assistant. And then I uh, graduated up to my own repair locker, uh, Repair 2 Bravo, which is in the forward part of the ship next to, uh, I think, Turk 2, if memory serves me correctly. And then I had my own crew of men who would uh, be firefighters or uh, uh, casualty recovery or, or the like. And that, I don't... I may have occasionally gone somewhere else just as part of my training to either observe um, evolutions in engineering as part of damage control or something like that, but those were my two main damage control stations. All right, and what about watch stations? So I had, um, having split my time between engineering and operations during my time, and also just as part of the general surface warfare officer training program, I stood um, engineering watches in main control in the third engine room. I stood, uh, started off as conning officer on the bridge, worked my way up to um, junior officer of the deck, and then finally once I got my surface warfare pin and officer of the deck letter, I was actually the officer of the deck underway. Um, there would be other things that you'd stand, you'd, sometimes they'd ro rotate you through the combat engagement center, so you could see that uh, at times I, you know, during the underway replenishments, I would be the helm safety officer, um, small boat officer, uh, and that was one of the other things about being a junior officer is the, just the multiplicity of duties you had. I, I think at one time I had like a dozen ancillary duties, including mercury safety officer, which to this day I still have no idea how to safely recover mercury. Um, the gauge calibration program, but one of my men was fully trained in it. So the extent of my leadership was, are we doing okay? Yes, sir. All right. Sounds good to me. Um, that's not how they write it in the book, but that's just the reality of life. Um, and there, especially in the surface warfare community, the, the number of things that you are expected to know and do, or at least be passingly familiar, it's just, it's mind boggling. And, uh, you know, and as I walk the decks, you know, I just like, man, I've been here. I've done that. I've seen this. Um, I think, I think we looked in the x-ray room and medical and that, that was the first space where I'm like, you know, I, I haven't been in this space. Uh, but, uh, you know, my duty and my training took me to all sorts of corners of the ship. And uh, that was that was one of the special things about being, uh, you know, surface line on the ship. All right. So um, talk about some of your ports of call and whether uh, any that stood out or what was your favorite. Wow. There was, there was so much. Um, there, the very first deployment that I, I was part of the 88 and the 89 deployments and, uh, you know, having good gone to Korea several times. Uh, we were in Seoul. We got to, uh, we actually home ported, not home ported, we ported in Incheon and then got to visit Seoul right prior to the 88 Summer Olympics. And just to get to see the tidal range at Incheon, it's one thing to read about it in a history book, but to actually start the, the day off looking down on the pier. And at the end of the day, you're actually looking up at the pier. It's like, wow, that, you know, it's, it's it, to see it actually demonstrated live, you, you truly realize the planning obstacles that they had to overcome for the, for the invasion in uh, 50. Um, Australia, of course, is just, well, I mean, the, the friendliness, the, uh, just the enthusiasm. I, uh, I was advanced party one time. I, um, the battleship was too big for a lot of the ports and we came into, I, I believe it was Brisbane, and we pulled the, the captain's gig up, and I'm in my whites, and we're basically setting up a table so men can check in and out um, as they get there or find information out about the towns, a place where the taxis can get them, come and get them. There's a line of women. Like, and they're like, oh, are you with the ship? It's like, yes, ma'am. It's just, how many men are on the ship? And I said, uh, about 1,200 with the other ships. There's probably about 2,500 of us with, with the other destroyers and company. And she said to me, she says, are they all as good looking as you? And I had to laugh because no one had ever said that to me before. And I said, I said, I think you'll find they're even better looking than I am. And she goes, Lord, help me. <laughs> so the, uh, the enthusiasm of Australian women for Americans was, was always very funny. And, um, it, uh, and I think all American sailors afterwards were just, you know, part of it's like, man, this is too easy. Uh, but, uh, and then getting to go to Tasmania, I mean, for God's sakes, how many people get to say they actually went to Tasmania? Uh, I took a tour. I actually got to see a Tasmanian devil. It don't look anything like the cartoon version, but <laughs> I got to see a Tasmanian devil. I mean, that's, that's pretty neat. 
right. Um, any travels through the Panama Canal, and what was that like? Uh, no. Uh, we were strictly Pacific Fleet mm -hmm. uh, the entire time, and I never, uh, in my duties, ever crossed from uh, ocean to ocean that way. Okay. Um, but you did cross the equator, and you had to go through a certain uh, tradition? Yes, yes. The international date line. So we, uh, us lucky few, got to be golden shellbacks, and... Uh, I'm not sure it's something, it's, it's hard to explain to people today because the, the Navy is so different, our society is so different, and I mean, it's a hazing ritual, and now you'd have people just whining, I mean, they, they would cut lengths of uh, fire hose into sections, and they would tape one end of it, and you know, this is copper jacketed rubber, and they're beating you with it, and it leaves marks, and that's just the way it was, and you, I mean, here's the thing, you didn't have to go through the shellback ceremony, don't go through the shellback ceremony, but but everyone knows you didn't go through the shellback ceremony. But it, it was just so funny. I mean, the, the day before, you have the revolt of the Wogs. And I think it was the XO they captured and held him hostage. And uh, we had Captain Wog, and he had got on the, the ship's TV and was, you know, proclaiming revolution and stuff like that. It, uh, it was just hilarious. And, of course, it wasn't that big a laughing matter the next day when they're just whomping on you with those shillelaghs and making you suck cherries out of some fat guy's belly button and stuff like that. And uh, at the end, uh, you know, you couldn't do that these days, but, you know, like almost a thousand of us, our uniforms are completely ruined, and they warn you not to wear your good stuff there, and just basically stripping naked and throwing uniforms over the side of the ship and going to take a shower. And But now you're golden shellback, so it's uh, special. And I, I still have the certificate. Uh, they actually gave us identification cards at one point. I... It's kind of like to find that one, but uh, mm -hmm. but that's one of those things. They can't take that away from you. So. <laughs> All right. Now, you did say you were um, part of the crew that was here there uh, for the Australian Bicentennial. Yes. Uh, did you get to lead any tours through the ship? Uh, I led a lot of tours. It was part And what was their reaction? Oh, uh, the, the enthusiasm. The thing that was very interesting, and, and it came from people who weren't even of the age um, to have been in World War II, but just the gratefulness. You know, thank you for helping us in World War II. You know, and of course you're thinking, well, you know, I wasn't there. The ship was there, <laughs> but I wasn't there. Um, so it was just, uh, you know, really heartfelt appreciation. And that's a thing that's sort of hard to, to fake. You know, you, that, like I said, that line of women waiting for the guys to come off the ship. Uh, you know, people don't just do that on their own. I mean, that, I mean, uh, you know, for fake motivations, they, they actually wanted to meet Americans and the like. And, I mean, the number of parties we got invited to. Um, although I, I will share one interesting incident, and I don't know if it ever made the newspapers or anything like that, but we were hounded from port to port by uh, certain groups, um, environmental groups, because the, the Navy, I guess the United States as a whole, had that um, don't disclose the presence of nuclear weapons on a, on a vessel. And so we would neither confirm, that was the, always the stock line, we will neither confirm nor deny the presence of nuclear weapons aboard USS New Jersey. And, uh, but they acted like we had them on there, and I, I to this day, I'm, I will neither confirm nuclear weapons aboard the ship. Um, but in the early morning hours, and I believe this was in Brisbane, some of the Greenpeace folks actually snuck up on the side of the ship and painted no nukes on the side of the ship. And one of, I don't know who discovered it, but said, hey, we got a problem, you know, because obviously what was going to happen in the early, as soon as the sun came up, they were going to take a picture of that, and it was going to be everywhere. So we put painters over the side at 3 in the morning and completely painted the side of the ship to get rid of that thing. Uh, so, you know, it's, I, we can laugh about it right now. You know, back then it was somewhat concerning from a security standpoint. Like, oh, my God, they, they got right up to us, and we didn't even notice. Um, and we had some fun with it. Uh, I think it was in Sydney, and it was almost ludicrous. It was a Greenpeace fan. And the guy's holding a Geiger counter out the window. Like, the, the ship's like a mile away out, out in the harbor. That's not going to do any good. And, uh, and someone comes up to one of uh, the more senior officers and says, Are there, so mate, do you, have, uh, do you have nuclear weapons on the ship? And he, uh, he motions to her. He says, There's none on our ship, but Ingersoll is loaded with them. <laughs> <laughs> completely against protocol but it was so funny and she just looked and like you know like you had to have some fun with it and uh, 
but the Australians as a whole, it was just a wonderful time to uh, to be there. And you know, and obviously their bicentennial, it was a, a very festive mood. And the uh, and for the very ceremony itself in Sydney Harbour, I mean, ships from the French Navy, the British Navy, Papua New Guinea. I mean, you name it. Uh, not the Soviet Navy. That would have made it interesting, but. It, it was true. It was an international naval review, and so you had, uh, uh, you know, Italian sh sailors fighting you for girls and bars and stuff like that. It was uh, it was quite the time. All right. Um, now, were you part of the crew that participated in the PAC X eighty nine ninety? Yes, I was. Uh, can you tell us some some things about that? It was, if I memory serves me correct, it was supposed to have been the largest gathering of international ships since World War II, if I remember correctly. And I just remember, you know, just looking out and, uh, and I had this copy of Combat Fleets of the World and I, you know, I would just stand on the bridge wing and like, okay, there's another one I could check off, another one I could check off. And just to get all those ships in formation. I mean, heck, it's hard enough to get your own Navy in formation and actually turn when you're supposed to and, you know, all these, you know, corp in this and corp in that. And, uh, but to get everyone in formation for the photo op and to just operate together like that, it was, it was, it was quite impressive. Um, you know, I wasn't senior enough at the time to be privy to, you know, all the machinations that were going on, but just to be young at that point. And, uh, and I think that's a kind of the recurring theme on the battleship is just it's like you're part of history. Uh, you know, just a continuous, you know, every time you're on a battleship, you know, this may be the last deployment, this may be the last time you visit here, this may be, or, you know, the first time a battleship does something or the like. So it, uh, uh, I mean, we went into the Persian Gulf in that deployment, and I don't think any battleships ever, had ever been in the Persian Gulf at that time. So it was, uh, yeah, you know, almost everything we did was, you know, historic. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, did you get a chance to cross paths with Admiral Reeves in at all? You know, I met him a couple times, um, but because I was mainly uh, assigned at that point down in the Combat Information Center, my dealings in the Combat Engagement Center were fairly limited, so it was, um, you know, just kind of, hi, how are you doing? All right. Um, did you get to meet any of your uh, commanding officers while you are on board, and tell us about them? So, I, um, when I first came on board, Captain Glenn was here, but I was only here a brief period of time, and then uh, he had a, a car accident afterwards. So uh, he was my commanding officer, but frankly, other than the, the handshake when I first came on board, I had, you know, no dealings with the man whatsoever. I had a lot of dealings with Captain Katz, uh, who was the commanding officer at that point. And then uh, my final uh, commanding officer was Commander Tuck, uh, Captain Tucker. And uh, he uh, he was very influential in my life. And, uh, you know, I, I, I some point, even though I left after active duty shortly thereafter, uh, you know, we remained in touch for many years and had some very spirited discussions and letters and stuff like that. So, um, the uh, and but from both men, you know, you learn something because they you don't get to be that point in your career as a battleship captain without bringing you know something remarkable to the table. Okay, uh, when did you uh depart to New Jersey? So, I have memory, uh. I finished the second deployment, and then I believe I left in May of 1990, and I went into the reserves mm -hmm. at that point. Um, I, th yeah, I think that's the correct timing. Okay. And you did some uh, service after right. you left so, New Jersey. Want yes. to give us a little recap of that? So I was in the reserves for another 25 years after that point. I retired in uh, mm -hmm. March of 2016. And I had a multiplicity of assignments. I did coastal warfare. I, I was actually in an aviation unit, of all things, as a surface line officer. Um, but probably my last three deployments were the memorable ones. I, I served in Iraq with an Army Civil Affairs unit. The, the Army needed help uh, with some of its ancillary missions. So they actually trained us in civil affairs, went to Fort Bragg, got to learn how to be... Uh, you know, riflemen and stuff like that. Actually got seconded to the British Army and then lived with the Iraqi Army. In Afghanistan, I was attached to another Army unit, lived on an Afghan base training Afghan policemen, um, you know, in various aspects of how to run a military. And then I concluded my military career in Djibouti with the uh, Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa, um, once again, working for an Army officer. But, uh, you know, it's got to see a lot of the world and got to 
uh, you know, when I was standing on the deck of the ship, if you had ever told me that I was going to be wearing an army uniform <clears throat> in Iraq, taking orders from a British officer, training Iraqi troops, I would have, I would have laughed at you. It's, it's improbable fiction, but uh, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, life takes you very interesting places when you're in the military. Okay. So when did you get out of the Navy? Uh, I retired for good in March of 2016. So I was so very on, recent. Very recently. Okay. Hence the beard. <laughs> ah. All right. Uh, is this the first time you've been back to the Battleship New Jersey? Yes, it is. You I, I attended the decommissioning ceremony in, uh, I want to say it was either February or March of 1991. And uh, had always intended at some point, you know, want to come visit it, want to come visit it. And, uh, you know, it's like, uh, I want to go got deployed, mm -hmm. you know, got back, starting a new, you know, as a reservist, you know, you always got to marry the civilian jobs along with your deployments and stuff like that. So it was always like life got in the way, but I, uh, you know, I was talking to my shipmate, Bill Shipley, and I said, we got to go, we got to go because you can keep putting it off forever and ever and ever. And I said, no, we're, we're finally going to do it. Of course, you know, we do it on the rainiest day of the, the spring so far, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's good to be back. All right. Um, so uh, let's talk about your impact post-naval life. I know you've only been retired for about a year or so, two years, um, but what impact did the naval service have on your life? You know, I'd say the main thing is it's um, a certain gravitas, uh, you know, and especially when you're a reservist because you're kind of living this dual world is, uh, you know, you've got a civilian job, but you, you know, you're also, you know, serving the country at the same time. And it's always laughable, for example, you know, you're in an office building and the air conditioning is not quite work working properly. And people are like, oh, this is awful. We can't get any work done. And, you know, and, and you got to be careful about this because, you know, you don't want to be, you know, that guy. But, well, you know, I was on a mission in Basra once and the air conditioning failed in this armored vehicle and it was 130 degrees outside. <laughs> now, that's hot. <laughs> uh, it, but it teaches you a lot of things. Like, you can get through this. Um, your body can withstand a lot more than you think. It can. Your mind can withstand a lot more than you think it can. Uh, uh, a, a determination to see the mission done, but at the same time recognizing, you know, there's a, there's a cost associated with things. Um, I, you know, and I'll be frank now that I'm out. You know, I'll speak frankly. Uh, my time in Iraq, I question I question a lot of things that we did. Uh, a lot of the missions that I participated in that I, you know, and I obeyed my orders to the limit. Um, you know, I'm not sure this is in our nation's interest. I'm not convinced that this isn't a horrible waste of money. I'm not convinced that we are not acting contrary to our interests. Obviously, you obey uh, orders, but you know, when you're on the front lines, and uh, you know, and, and as another example, my my last posting in Djibouti, you know, we're debating policy for Somalia. You know, people talking about this who are stateside, and I said, you know, for those of us living here in Africa, dealing with this. I'm telling you that what you're saying, those Somalis don't exist in real life. You know, the Somali that's, uh, that's convinced that such a thing as the federal government of Somalia exists, he doesn't exist. That's not how Somalis think, and we see it every day because this is the mission that we're on. And when you're in military service and on the front line, it, it kind of strips away a lot of the illusions that people have. And, uh, and it's always a reminder of me to me that... Whenever you have a situation where you were not firsthand present, you know, sometimes you need to stop and think and listen to people who actually were there, uh, who've got the facts on the ground. Um, I think there's something valuable to that, especially in this day and age when so few people do serve, uh, either serve in law enforcement or serve in the military or things like that, um, and, and recognize that, you know, there's theory and then there's reality. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the Naval Service has, has shaped my entire life. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's, um, I, like I said, I know you've only retired for a couple of years. So when I ask <laughs> about post-Navy life, uh, let's just, since your Navy career, uh, let's rephrase the question to um, talk about, you know, while you're in Navy life, you know, family, um, your career, while you were in the Reserve, you did say you had a civilian job. So let's uh, just do a recap of that. Since uh, since that, so I if if I were going to sum me up in that regard, I'm I'm more about experience than career building mm -hmm. or uh, you know climbing the ladder and things like that. Um, I've worked as a power plant engineer, 
I've worked at a university. I have worked as a business consultant. I currently, I work at a credit union as a financial analyst. It's not the, um, you know, with my education and experience, I'm probably eligible for more senior responsible positions. But at this point in my life, uh, when I got my orders to Iraq, uh, when I actually executed the orders, my daughter had just been born three weeks before. Uh, when I was in Afghanistan, uh, my youngest daughter was a year old. And when I spent my year in Djibouti, uh, you know, I missed, you know, another year of their lives. And so, you know, it gives you an appreciation of, uh, you know, kind of what's important to you. And at this point, you know, I decided that I'd rather be there for my kids' uh, lives than, you know, trying to squeeze out a few more thousand dollars by getting a more responsible position or living somewhere that I don't want to live. Um, and, and I think that's part of the military as well as, you know, recognizing, you know, just for myself, I like the adventure. You know, I, I enjoyed being in Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, I was hit by an IED on one of my missions. Um, you know, no one wants, no one wants to be the casualty, uh, but you have to accept the risks and being in the military. But uh, at the same time, it's, you know, it's time to put the adventure aside and concentrate on raising the family. So you learn a lot about what's important to you, you know, when you do that. Um, so I'd say it's more about the journey and the experience than, you know, trying to climb to a top of a particular heap or something like that. Excuse me, my, my allergies are killing me here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, okay. Please. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, um, drill. <laughs> now, uh, in closing, you did want to uh, talk about a story of Tiger Cruises, yes. so I'll let you, we'll finish with that. So this, you know, as I mentioned about, uh, you know, getting to build the model of the ship when I was a kid, but when I was at that age, uh, my dad was a plank owner on USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, CVN 69, built in Newport News, and we lived in Virginia Beach. So I got to go on a Tiger Cruise with him for a week. And that was remarkable, just getting to see the airplanes take off and land and, and all of that stuff and getting to roam the ship. It's nice when you're not a watch standard. You've got all the time in the world to, to experience things. Um, but on the second deployment, um, and it had been traditional at that point for packed fleet ships, is when you stopped in Pearl Harbor, you could take on male dependents and uh, take the Tiger crews from Pearl Harbor back to, um, to wherever your home port was, be it Long Beach, California, like it was for us at Terminal Island or San Diego or, um, you know, wherever. And uh, I was fortunate that my father got to come on board for that Tiger Cruise in 89. Uh, actually, I'll take that back. It's now 90 at that point. And, uh, you know, here we're in Pearl Harbor, and he had been stationed in Pearl Harbor as his first duty station, and he hadn't been back since, gosh, the late 1950s. And uh, get the tour of the, the Arizona and see all these things. And then to, to get to go back on the ship with him, 